I said. Um, uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, you are clear. Awesome. Yeah, so today I'll talk about data quality in gravitational wave detectors. Uh, this is the overview. I'll start with um, LIGO strain data, then I'll move on to LIGO data quality. I'll talk about uh, noise transients, the non-Gaussian noise transients that we have, auxiliary channels, uh, category vetoes, hardware injections, and then um, I'll give a brief summary of O3 and our preparations for O4. I also have quite a few references, so I suggest you uh, please check them out. They include lots of papers and other sources uh, that will help you get a deeper understanding of most of the stuff that I'll talk about in, in these slides. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a very simplified picture of the detector. We have a laser, we have two four kilometer arms, we have a beam splitter and output photo detector. Um, the essential idea is that um, a gravitational wave interacts with the system, changes the length of the arms, and then we read the strain in the gravitational wave channel, which is sampled at uh, 16 kilohertz. Um, it's, it's more complicated than how I described it because we have other uh, things that also uh, move these arms and um, a lot of details go into this process of calibration. I've included a paper on calibration in the reference and I suggest to uh, read it if you want to find out the nitty gritty details of how we do that. Uh, but we can ask this question, what does the strain data look like? So here on this, on this slide, I have the raw time series, uh, which this is how we start. We start with the raw time series and I have three plots here. We have quiet data, we have noisy data, and we also have a gravitational wave. But uh, if you look at this uh, six seconds of data, so we have time on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis, if you look at all these three plots, you can't really tell which is which just by looking at them because they all look very similar. So uh, we do quite a bit of data processing on top of this, uh, this raw time series that we start with. So we start with the raw time series, but then we whiten the data and then we band pass it. Uh, what do I mean by whitening? So as Beck also mentioned uh, in her talk yesterday, uh, the data that we have, the raw time series that we have, it contains a lot more, um, lot more power at lower frequencies than at higher frequencies. And that kind of overshadows or dwarfs uh, the features at higher frequencies. So we whiten the data, and by that I mean we normalize the power in different in all these frequency bins so that the, high, the, the features at higher frequencies are also better visible. Once we have whitened the data, we band pass it. And what do I mean by band passing it? So we take a lower frequency cutoff and we take a higher frequency cutoff, and we say, I'm only inter interested in whatever is going on between these two thresholds. I'm not interested in anything, say, below. 10 hertz or anything above 300 hertz, just tell me what's going on between 10 hertz and 300 hertz. And when you do that, you, you find out some nice features. And there can be multiple reasons why you want to apply these, uh, apply these thresholds, maybe because you already expect uh, something within this frequency range. So after we do all this, as you can see from these plots, now uh, some features are much better visible. If you look at the first plot, nothing much is going on there. Uh, the second plot seems like uh, there's a big spike in the middle of the middle of the plot, so maybe there's a glitch. And uh, the third plot, maybe you have seen this signature quite a few times by now, but that looks like uh, like a gravitational wave. So after that, after Ben passing it and and um, whitening it and Ben passing it, we do something really dramatic. We Q transform this data. And Q-transform essentially allows us to visualize this data in time frequency space. And as you can see, uh, what we have now is, is, is much nicer. And we can, we can clearly see the differences in the th three plots. So we have the quiet data, as I said in the last slide. And then we have a rather loud glitch uh, with lots of saturation in yellow. And finally, we have the gravitational wave. So this Q-transform is really useful. And I'll talk about what Q-transform is and how it does what it does. But essentially, it's really useful because um, it helps us with understanding the noise morphology. So how does the noise looks like in time frequency plane? It helps us with noise identification and classification. And again, a few slides down, I'll talk about uh, the noise classification. And it also helps us with finding potential correlation with other parts of the instrument. So if you see this loud glitch in the primary gravitational wave channel, and then you see a similar uh, looking glitch in other part of the detector, you may be like, Okay, there is some connection between that part of the detector and the primary gravitational wave channel. So Q-transform helps us with all of this. 
So just to summarize this section, we started with raw time series and that didn't really uh, help us much, but then we applied a bunch of data processing techniques, starting with whitening and, and passing, and finally, uh, finally obtaining a Q transform. And then we end up with something that's, that's a lot more useful. So now let's talk about the LIGO data quality. So this is the sensitivity plot. Uh, you probably have seen this before, uh, but this sensitivity plot essentially tells us how good a job we are doing or how sensitive our detector is. And the lower it is, the better it is because then we can discover more gravitational waves. Uh, and so we do a lot of things to improve the sensitive sensitivity, uh, both during the observing run, but mainly uh, after the observing run. So once an observing run ends, uh, we make a lot of changes uh, that improve the overall sensitivity of the detector. And these changes include um, increasing the laser power, uh, obtaining new test mass mirrors, because sometimes some issues with test mirrors can also reduce the sensitivity of the detector, uh, employing light squeezing, which helps with the, with the quantum noise, fixing sources of noise uh, during an observing run is going on. We figure out, um, we figure out, we find out about a lot of sources of noise and once the observing run ends, maybe we can fix those sources and have a better sensitivity. And uh, we also have a ton of small improvements that go on uh, helping us detect more black holes. Um, so once again, coming back to this, uh, this plot, we have seismic noise that dominates at low frequency and seismic noise is because the earth is constantly moving. It's always shaking at lower frequencies and that diminishes our ability to, to get good data at those frequencies. And then we have short noise at higher frequency and short noise is a type of quantum noise, um, which, uh, which is due to the, due to the uncertainty uh, in the number of photons that hit the photodetector. And that's why we have light squeezing, which helps with, uh, with reducing the short noise. Okay, so short noise and, and seismic noise, these are Gaussian noise, these, these don't change. These are also stationary. They don't change from morning to evening or from one month to another. But we also have non-Gaussian uh, and non-stationary noise, which we call transients. And I'll spend a lot of time talking about these transients in this, uh, in this talk. So what exactly are, are noise transients? Uh, one way to define them is that they are excess power over a very short duration, and we also call them glitches. So if you look at the plot on the right, this is a distribution of these transients over a day in February 2020. We have time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis, and the colors represents uh, the signal-to-noise ratio, so uh, the how loud uh, our noise transient is. How do we detect these transients? Well, we have a tool uh, called Omicron. So Omicron takes in the strain data uh, from the primary gravitational wave channel, but also from other auxiliary channels, and it finds these excess power uh, in, in the strain data, and we call them Omicron triggers. Um, that, that you see on the on, on this plot, every single dot on this on this plot is is an omicron trigger. Uh, finally, what causes these transients? Well, uh, there are a ton of things that can cause these transients: environmental disturbances, uh, bad weather, thunderstorms, which are very common at Li uh, near LIGO Livingston, uh, ground motion, uh, change in humidity in a particular subsystem of the detector or anything uh, going wrong with a detector component can cause these transients. So we have, we have lots of reasons of why we may have these transients. So uh, once again, our, our friend Q-transform is back. I'm using Q-transform now to show how these noise transients look in time frequency plane. Uh, once again, we have time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. And what I'm trying to show here is that we have different types of transients based on how they uh, how they look in this time frequency plane. If you look at this uh, Omicron plot, we can't tell much uh, from this, like how these transients look or how they differ from each other, but we can use Q-transform to do that. Um, and why, why are these transients bad? Well, for more than a couple of reasons. They can mask a real gravitational wave signal. So for example, if you have a gravitational wave and at the same time you have, you have one of these uh, glitches, uh, then you might not be able to see the gravitational wave pro uh, properly because usually these, these transients are louder than the gravitational waves that we have. They can also mimic a signal. So uh, if, we, if you have a transient uh, at LIGO Livingston and at the same time you have a transient at either Virgo or LIGO Hanford, then the analysis pipelines might get confused and think that we have a gravitational wave 
when in fact we have noise. So they can mimic a signal, they can mask a signal, and they can reduce our confidence in the detection. These transients can also reduce our astrophysical range, which is, uh, which is a measure of how far we can see in the universe and how far we can detect uh, the binary coalescence from. So for the duration that we have these transients, they can, they can reduce our astrophysical range. The loud glitch that I showed you in one of the earlier slides is in fact uh, infamously called range killer because of the uh, awful impact it has on the range. Um, these transients can also introduce problems for parameter estimation that Aditya just discussed uh, in, his, in his slides. Um, so the big question is, where do these transients originate? Well, these transients usually originate in auxiliary channels. So I, I only talked about the primary gravitational wave channel, but we also have tons of auxiliary channels. Uh, we, have, we have a channel that measures how much the test mass mirror is moving with respect to suspension cage. We have, a, we have an auxiliary channel that, that looks at the beam alignment. We have auxiliary channels that tell us how much the ground is moving uh, at different locations in the detector in the three X, Y, Z direction. So we have tons of auxiliary channels and sometimes something uh, goes wrong in one of these channels. And if we are really unfortunate, it may permeate to the gravitational wave channel and create problems for us. So now this is a, is a much more detailed uh, plot of our figure of the, of the detector. We have laser on the left here. Then we have uh, the input mode cleaner, which is formed by IM1, IM2, and IM3. It's a triangular cavity. The input mode cleaner is used to clean the laser of the non-Gaussian modes. Then we have the power recycling cavity. Uh, you see PR3, PR2, and PRM. And the power recycling cavity uh, increases the overall power that's incident on the beam splitter, uh, which is right here. Then we have these four kilometer long uh, Fabry Pro cavity arms. And uh, once the laser goes here, it spends quite a bit of time here. And because it, it moves back and forth multiple times, and this increases the overall interaction time of the gravitational wave with the laser. And so it has more time to leave its signature. And then we have a signal recycling cavity here, and we have an output mode cleaner, which, which is kind of similar to input mode cleaner, but it is a bow tie cavity, and it helps with cleaning the auxiliary lasers. And finally, we have the uh, we have the OMCT CPD, which is where we uh, we measure the strain. So this is a much more detailed uh, figure, but it also tells you that we have so many subsystems, and each of these subsystems have so many auxiliary channels. So it's a really complicated network. It's a very complicated detector. And sometimes something can go wrong in any of these subsystem or any of these channel and that can create problems for us. So um, what, what do we do about this transient noise? Uh, well, the first step is to identify the noise. And when I say identify, I mean, figure out its features. Uh, what is the duration? How frequently it happens? Is it more frequent on weekdays than on weekends? Uh, does it have any correlation with trucks coming to the site, with thunderstorms? Is it more frequent in one month than the other? So the first step is figuring out all these properties of the transient noise. This, once you have done that, the second step is to look for the potential correlations with the auxiliary channels and subsystems. So that means, uh, trying to find out if some other auxiliary channels or if some other subsystems have also noise at the same time uh, we have noise in the primary gravitational wave channel. Once you have done that, the job is not yet done. It's still a correlation, uh, maybe not a causation, but still a correlation. So the next step is to perform tests to simulate the noise. So now maybe you want to move some mirror or you want to shake some component of the detector to see if that would actually create noise in the gravitational wave channel. Uh, and if that happens, maybe you are in luck, uh, maybe you, then you talk to the people at the site and you say, hey, when we do something here, uh, it actually creates noise in the primary gravitational wave channel. And if you can convince them of that coupling, uh, maybe we can fix that source of noise to either reduce it or eliminate it. Um, sometimes all of this doesn't happen. In fact, most of the time, uh, there is some issue with one of these steps and we are not able to get rid of that noise, so then we develop vetoes. And I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by vetoes uh, a few slides down. Um, to do all of this, there are quite a few detector characterization tools or data quality tools that help us. We have Gravity Spy, we have Q-Transform that I mentioned a couple of times, 
we have HVTO, we have a scattering tool, we have Omicron that I also mentioned, and summary pages. So now in the next few slides, I'm going to look at some of these tools and, and, and discuss how they work and how they help us. So let's start, let's start with the Q transform. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, it helps us visualize the glitch morphology in the time frequency plane. Uh, the Q transform, it starts with taking the data and it projects the data on, onto a multi-resolution basis, uh, which is parameterized by time, frequency, and Q, which is, uh, Q is, uh, is a constant ratio of duration to bandwidth. So you can also think of, when you look at this uh, figure on the right, you can also think of Q as the aspect ratio. So the Q transform creates these multiple spectrograms with constant Q, uh, and then it optimizes over, over these planes and picks a plane which contains the loudest uh, time frequency tile. And once it picks a plane, it means it has picked a Q. Uh, so you have, you have what it returns at the end is a, is a high resolution spectrogram uh, with a specific Q value and with a specific uh, event uh, time and frequency. Um, next tool is Gravity Spy, and this is one of my favorite detector characterization tool, and I have been personally involved with it quite a bit. Uh, Gravity Spy is an image recognition algorithm which is based on convolutional neural network. Uh, I guess you guys have seen uh, some of these uh, some of these algorithms which tell you whether it's a cat or a dog. Here we are using more than just two categories. We have uh, we have Gravity Spy that helps us uh, that helps us classify twenty three transient noise uh, in, in, in LIGO uh, during the third observing run. And I have six of these categories here. Uh, this algorithm is trained on these time frequency spectrograms of noise transients. So we, we train the gravity spy first. We tell us that, hey, if it looks like this, it's a whistle. If it looks like this, it's a blip. And if it looks like this, it's a fast scattering. So we train this algorithm on, on a bunch of, uh, bunch of these um, noise transients examples. And then once we are satisfied uh, with how it's performing, then we allow it or then we use it to, to classify the transient noise that we have during the observing run. So it uses Omicron triggers as the input and the output is the predicted glitch category. Now Gravity Spy is really useful in the sense that uh, Omicron tells us which day we have a lot of transients, but then Gravity Spy, what it does is that it tells us which day we had a specific type of noise transients. So for example, if there is a day with a lot of fast scattering, and then we go back and look at that day and we find that this day had, uh, had a lot of trains passing by near LIGO Livingston, or it had a lot of seismic noise in, in one to three hertz band, and that's why probably we had a lot of fast scattering. So it helps us correlate the type of transients that we have with the conditions that may be present at the detector. And in that sense, it's really useful. We also have um, HVTO, uh, which, which is, stands for hierarchical veto. And what HVTO does is that it finds coincidences, uh, time coincidences between transients in gravitational wave channel and transients in auxiliary channel. So if you look at the figure on the figure on the bottom, uh, this auxiliary channel has six uh, transients. Uh, the H of T, the primary gravitational wave channel, has five transients, and uh, there are a total of three coincidences. So HVTO finds statistical correlations between noise in gravitational wave channel and auxiliary channel, and then it assigns a significance to this, these correlations. What do I mean by significance? Uh, significance is essentially uh, quantifying uh, how unlikely it is to have as many time coincidences compared to what you would expect uh, from a Poisson distribution. So for example, uh, you take 100 seconds of data and you find, uh, you find 10 coincidences. And you do this number of times, and most of the times, you, on average, you find 10 or 12 coincidences. And then one day, you again take 100 seconds of data, and now all of a sudden, you have 60 coincidences. So you're like, OK, now something special is going on. So that is what I mean by significance. HVTO uh, progresses in, in, in multiple rounds. So at the start of the round, it assembles all these, uh, all these coincidences. It assigns. Uh, significance to, to these auxiliary channel and the channel with the highest significance is declared round winner. And at the end, uh, end of this round, HVTO takes away all these transients which were found coincident with the round winner. And then it starts the second round and it does it over and over again. So HVTO is really useful in helping us find the correlations between what's going on in the primary gravitational wave channel 
and some other auxiliary channels. So you can look at HV2 output and then you can start your study from there that maybe, okay, I want to look at this LSC, raffle, ALF, or DQ channel because this seems, this seems uh, very correlated with, with the noise in gravitational wave channel. We also have summary pages and they are incredibly useful. Uh, well, summary pages contain, uh, contain the output of a lot of these tools that I mentioned, but it also contains a lot of information, real-time information about what is going on at the detector. So the first plot, for example, shows you the binary neutron star uh, in spiral range uh, at Livingston for, for this day. The second plot shows the vertical ground motion in one hertz to three hertz band. And we have instances where this ground motion goes really high. Uh, the third plot shows the um, output mode cleaner suspension point motion and the noise there. And you, as you can see between one hertz and about seven or eight hertz, there's quite a bit of noise in that, in that period from, uh, from noon to 18 UTC. And finally, I have this plot of just the gravitational wave strain channel, the noise in that strain channel. Now, all these plots are from different days, so you won't find really any correlations here, but we use summary pages to study uh, these correlations in different parts of the detector uh, with the primary gravitational wave channel, but also to, to read the output of some of these tools that I mentioned. Slow scattering uh, reduction. So. Uh, a couple of slides ago, I showed you uh, lots of transients and one of them is slow scattering. Now we had a lot of slow scattering during the third observing run uh, at, at all the detectors like Livingston, Hanford, and even Virgo. And we were able to use these tools and more to figure out the noise coupling. We were able to find that there are two specific channels that were highly coupled with, with the noise, uh, with the slow scattering noise in the primary gravitational wave channel. And we were able to go through all those steps that I mentioned earlier to establish this noise coupling and uh, make changes so that after we were done fixing the source of noise, uh, the amount of amount of slow scatter was reduced drastically. So this is this is an example of how you, we can use these data quality tools to to reduce the noise and the transient noise in the detector. What happens when we are not able to do that? Well, then we can develop these vetoes that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these data quality vetoes uh, can be defined as flagged times. Uh, these are times when the quality of the data is, is not that good. We, we are not satisfied with the data quality uh, in, in these time segments. So we, we develop these data quality uh, flags and these flags are distributed in different categories that depend on not just the severity of the issue, but also on um, our understanding of, of the issue. So we have CAT1 vetoes, which is when there's a ma major issue going on with a key detector component. So either some key detector component is not working or some maintenance is going on and the data is not usable. So we don't really use that data. Then we have category two vetoes, uh, which we apply when we have um, a noise coupling that we have a good understanding of. So we know that uh, we know that there is a specific channel which, uh, which when you know has transients in it, it creates transients in in H of T. So once we have a good understanding of the noise coupling for those transients, we can develop category two vetoes. The third category is when uh, we there is some statistical coupling, but that's not very well understood. So this is what H veto does. Uh, H veto tells you statistical noise coupling, but they, that might simply be correlation and we might not be able to establish any correlation, sorry, causation. So in that case, we have these category three vetoes. These are all cumulative in the sense that uh, if, we have, if we have cat one veto, then, uh, then we'll have all higher categories as well. Uh, we don't want to have a lot of time vetoed because then you're taking time away from uh, obser observing gravitational waves. So at the heart of developing these veto is this, is this principle of high efficiency and low deck time. So by high efficiency, I mean, uh, we should be able to develop vetoes in such a way that removes a rather large fraction of transients. And by low deck time, I mean that uh, these, these flag times should be a small fraction of the total observing time. So we have to, we have to be really careful uh, when, we, when we develop these vetoes. Uh, we also have hardware injection and hardware injection is when we inject a signal uh, that, that actually moves one of the test masses. 
We do this to establish the safety of vetoes and to, and to create a list of safe and unsafe auxiliary channel. So we, we inject the sine Gaussians at different frequencies and amplitude because we want to check over, uh, over a broad range uh, of amplitude and in different frequency regions. And that helps us establish the safety. So what do I mean by safe auxiliary channel? A channel, a safe auxiliary channel is one which does not respond to hardware injections in primary gravitational wave channel. And such a channel can be used to develop vetoes for primary gravitational wave channel transients. We, we can't use unsafe channels because uh, say you have a gravitational, we don't, we don't want to use unsafe channel because unsafe channels are sensitive to primary gravitational wave channel. And uh, mistakenly, you may veto a gravitational wave. So for example, if, if you have a gravitational wave in the primary gravitational wave channel, and then you have an unsafe auxiliary channel that is sensitive to it, so it may have some transient. And if you veto that transient, if you take out that time, then you're essentially taking out the gravitational wave. So it's, it's very important to have this list of safe and unsafe channels because only safe channels can be used uh, to develop the vetoes. And for that, we perform these hardware injections. Finally, I'll give a brief summary of, um, of O3 um, and, and, and our preparations for O4. So O3 uh, was split into O3A and O3B. Uh, O3A was from April 1 to September 30, and O3B was from November 1 to March 27, 2020. We had a total of 74 gravitational waves detected in that time period, uh, 39 in O3A and 35 in O3B. And I, I suggest to go over the uh, our catalog paper that includes a lot of details about all of these uh, all, all of these events that we have discovered. They included signals from binary black holes, binary neutron stars, and even neutron star black holes. Uh, the plot on the bottom left shows the range um, during O3B of LIGO Livingston, LIGO Hanford, and Virgo. And the plots on the right show us the observing segments. So if if you look at the network duty factor, the pie chart on the bottom, that tells us that about 44.5% of the time, we had all the three interferometers observing at the same time. Uh, about 37% of the time, we had at least two interferometers. So either uh, LIGO Livingston and LIGO Hanford or LIGO Livingston and Virgo or Virgo and LIGO Hanford. So we had at least two interferometers observing. And 15% uh, of the time, we only had one interferometer and at about 3%, we did not have a single interferometer observing. So as you can see, at least 85 or 82% of the time, we had at least two interferometer, which is, which is really good. Uh, preparations for O4, the plot on the figure on the top right shows you uh, our expectations from O4 and O5. Uh, we are expecting a range of about 160 to 190 megaparsec for LIGO, and this is binary neutron star range. Uh, similarly for Virgo, we are expecting a range between 80 and 115, and Kagra would be joining us uh, with an estimated range between 1 and 3 megaparsec. Uh, O4 currently is scheduled for uh, to begin in December 2022, and there are quite a few changes that we'll have in O4. We'll have new mirrors, uh, we'll have higher laser power, and uh, possibly mitigation of low frequency noise that will that will help us with the sensitivity and all of this uh, all of these changes will 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 um, help us with with a better sensitivity and a lot more gravitational waves so um, thank you very much for attending this talk and uh, i'll be taking your questions as i said we have uh, lots and lots of references here that i suggest to check out uh, that will that will help with uh, with these slides thank you